So today we're trimming out a kitchen countertop. We're gonna talk about the installation of individual devices, receptacles, switches, GFCI receptacles, the various types, but we're also gonna talk about the code requirements for outlet spacing, maximum heights, minimum heights related to kitchen countertop, as well as circuiting, so you've got a total perspective on how to wire a simple straight run kitchen countertop. Let's do it. So here I've got my white conductors on the rough end, before drywall was hung, these are actually neutrals. And they've been pre-twisted and then with a properly sized wire net secured together. A mechanical fastener is required. And you can see the twist in the white wires. That's just evidence that the electrician who connected these really took pains to make sure that they were securely fastened. In fact, uh, Jefferson Electric, we, we require that a set of wires be so well secured together that they would make a quality connection even without the wire net. Of course, the wire net is required as well. Now, uh, the one reason I mentioned the white conductors is that in switching, white does not always represent neutral. If a white conductor is going to be used for another purpose, it must be permanently or durably marked. Typically, we'll use a flag of colored tape, black, brown, red, blue, yellow, something of that nature. I'm done with the whites, my neutrals. I'm going to fold them and carefully tuck them to the back of the box. Before I get too far into this and handling my hot or ungrounded conductors, I'm using a Klein non-contact voltage detector to verify my conductors are dead. I've already tested this on a known live circuit first to ensure functionality. So you can see my grounds, again, same practice. They've been wrapped around each other for a secure connection. A mechanical connector is required by code. And then the second ground has been trimmed off. I'm not gonna utilize it for this installation. And so I have one grounding conductor left. Ground is represented by green or bare. My red conductor is a traveler. The reason I have a red conductor in this installation is because this is a three-way switch. That's a multi-location switch. In this case, there are two locations that will control the overhead lights in the kitchen. And so I'm using a 14-3 to send two conductors, a black and a red, in addition to my white and ground from this location to the other switching location. The reason that this is made up is for temporary purposes only. I'm going to unmake this connection using my lineman's pliers to untwist the conductors. And again, we wanted temporary construction lighting in the kitchen so that everybody could see what they're doing, but that's for temporary purposes only. So all of my conductors are stripped. These are 14 gauge solid conductors. That's standard for residential lighting. And one of the things that we're up against in this situation and it's always the case, anytime that a house is sprayed, the prime coat, the, the finish coats, and in this case, this is just the prime coat, but um, the conductors inside the box get covered. So what I do is typically I'll take the proper size hole on my strippers, 14 gauge solid, and I will just clean up the ends of the conductors so we've got a, a quality electrical connection. And that is a code requirement. The end of the conductors must be free from anything that inhibits a quality electrical connection, such as paint or primer or drywall mud. So at this point, I've got a red and a black from my three wire. These are my travelers. I have a hot or common, and I've got a ground connection. That's perfect. I've got four terminals, a ground, a common, which is um, designated by the um, the odd color terminal screw, and I've got two brass screws, and those are designed for my travelers. So I'm gonna take the tip of my Milwaukee strippers. I'm gonna create a fold or a bend that's the right size and shape for my terminal screw. And I want it to be a good wrap in a clockwise direction. This is really important to me. Um, a good quality connection is what differentiates a real electrician from a handyman. So I've got, a, I've got a clockwise wrap such that when I tighten the screw, not death grip, you will strip it out. Um, when I tighten the screw, it pulls the conductor 
into the terminal versus if it was counterclockwise, it would force, when a righty tidy, it would force that conductor out of the terminal screw. I'm gonna repeat the process right on the end of each of my conductors. I'm gonna bend them to the right. If any of these conductors have been damaged, for instance, when these were pre-twisted for the purpose of obtaining temporary overhead lighting, if they were overly twisted, there's a real possibility that they had suffered damage. In that case, I wanna look for a deep nick or any type of compromised um, point in the copper conductor, then I want to cut that off and re-strip it. So I've got solid, intact copper conductor. I'm going to take my red and put it on either of the two screws of the same color. Again, red is Traveler. That's the, one of the two conductors that goes from this switch to the other multi-location switch. Both of these switches are called three ways. I'm going to take my black that is paired in the same cable as my red conductor, that is also a traveler, and I'm going to terminate it to the second screw of the same color. And then I'm gonna take my common. Again, all of these twisted and wrapped around the terminal screw in a clockwise direction. And I'm gonna secure with the number one screwdriver. This is a number one square drive. It is the, the best and optimal screwdriver for each of these connections, and I'm gonna secure the terminal screw. I want zero play, zero play and wiggle in any of these connections. This is critical. And then um, the orientation of the switch. Before we tuck and fold these conductors safely back into the box, the orientation of the switch is either way. But what I need to do is I need to pair this switch with that switch such that when the lights are off, both switches of the multi-location lighting are in the down position. That's what I'm shooting for here. So I'm not worried at this point, um, executing my first switch, the orientation of this switch. So I'm gonna tuck and fold all of the conductors together. I'm gonna watch out for my grounding conductor. See at this point, my grounding conductor is real close to one of my travelers. I'm gonna be very intentional every single time I execute the installation of a device to make sure that grounding conductor is pushed back or tucked away from any of the live conductors or terminals. Otherwise, I could end up with a dead short, or worse yet, a high resistance short. A high resistance short is where I've got a poor connection from hot to ground, but there is a connection nonetheless. And in that case, rather than having an instantaneous trip on the breaker, what you'll experience is a slow trip. Lights will be on for 15 minutes, everything's working fine. After 15 minutes of slowly drawing overcurrent and heating up that breaker, you'll experience a trip. Suddenly everything goes out. So I have got my, you'll notice here too, in the, the mounting screw on the yoke of the device, there's play left and right. And that's intentional. At this point, this switch being by itself, I don't really care if it's further to the left or right, unless I want that plate to hide a big scar in the drywall. I will take my screwdriver, utilize it as a lever, force it in the direction of the scar on the drywall so that my plate on finish covers that damage. And then whatever I do with the bottom screw, I'm gonna match it with the top screw. I'm utilizing my finger as a support to just hold it in that position so the device is not cocked one way or the other. We want a true vertical. And the switch, well, this switch will never be under a significant amount of strain. It's a simple up and down motion, so I don't need to secure the heck out of it. In fact, if the box is recessed behind the drywall, let's say an eighth of an inch, then if I do secure it really, really tight, what I can actually end up doing is compressing the drywall, concaving the switch, and not getting a clean finish on my switch plate. So in this case, it's secure. I've not deformed the switch at all by over securing it. There's no play left in the switch. Now there's no play left in the switch. And uh, I've got a good, good clean finish. Um, something we mentioned on the rough-in is boxes spaced properly such that the yoke of the device secures to the box um, in a secure and tight manner. This being a combustible material, um, we've got a maximum of 
quarter inch that that box can be recessed behind the finished surface of the drywall. Using a 3 16 straight blade screwdriver to secure my plate. And in particular, because all of these devices that we're about to install are in close proximity, I wanna make sure that all of the plate styles and types are of the same manufacturer and style. And I'm gonna orient all of my screws in the horizontal. This is something that's important to me. It demonstrates conscientiousness in the quality and the details of the task. And when a customer sees a finished product like this, they don't know what's behind the drywall and they don't have the ability to evaluate your work. But what they can see is that you took care in the small details and that will give them confidence about the rest of the task.